Hello everybody, and welcome back to History Time. So today I'm just going to give you a brief preview of my upcoming book, The Palestine Campaigns, by Archibald Wavell, Field Marshal Wavell, and uh, I want to just build a bit of hype for it to come out. I'm expecting it to be released towards the end of December 2021, if you're listening in the future, or perhaps in January 2022, I'm not too sure. I'll be releasing the whole thing, the full audio book, on YouTube as well as on Audible if you prefer to get it over there or as a hardback book but more details of that will come in the future. What I wanted to do first though was part of this little preview where I'm going to give you the first chapter of the book which is I don't know just insane it's brilliant um, and if you really enjoy the stuff I do on here normally you will enjoy this. So who is Archibald Wavell? For those who don't know, Field Marshal Wavell. He wrote the book, of course, at the time when he was just a colonel. Uh, so let me just, I'll just run through his, uh, his accolades, his, uh, his titles, and you'll get an idea of who this dude was. So he was Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath, Knight Grand Commander of the Order of the Star of India, Knight Grand Commander of the Order of the Indian Empire, Companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. Uh, he had a military cross. Uh, the Knight of Justice of the Order of St. John. So he's a Knight's Templar or, a knight, you know, a Knight of Malta. Uh, Order of St. Stanislaw, third class with swords from Russia. Uh, the Order of St. Vladimir. Uh, Crux de Guerre of France. Uh, Commander of the Legion of Honor in, from, from France as well, obviously. Uh, the Order of El Nada, second class. Only second. Uh, Grand Cross of the Order of George I with swords. Uh, Vecuta Militari, 5th class from Poland. Uh, the War Cross, 1st class from Greece. Commander of the Order of the Seal of Solomon, Ethiopia. Uh, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of Orange Nassau uh, from the Netherlands. War Cross from Czechoslovakia. Chief Commander of the Legion of Merit from the uh, United States. So yeah, that's just a, a collection of some of his awards. He's got many, many more. But uh, yeah, General Wavell is the epitome of a soldier of the empire. There's not many others like him, really. I mean, he's he's one of the standout guys from the early sort of 20th century. And um, yeah, just like uh, an, an insane career and an insane life. Uh, so yeah, he, he basically started, um, he was born 1883 and he died in 1950. Uh, but he was a senior officer of the British Army. I'm just reading the Wikipedia, right? Okay. But I suggest you go and look up the man yourself because there's so many little asides about him that you know, you really need to look it up and it'll lead you down various rabbit holes. He served in the Second Boer War, where my, my great-great-granddad did as well when he was 15. Uh, the Bizarre Valley Campaign, which is essentially like uh, a punitive expedition against a bunch of uh, Pashtuns who were raided in India. That's not that's not out of the ordinary, right? This one's just got a name. Like, if it, like it, it was big enough, it was big enough a raid from a group of um, Afghans to uh, warrant an expedition. Otherwise, it was you know this kind of thing happened a lot, and I, I imagine it still does on the border zone there, uh, like just raiders into uh, India. Uh, and the First World War, during which he was wounded in the Second Battle of Ypres. And uh, he lost his eye in Ypres. And if you look at the picture, which you can see here, that's one of the reasons why he's wearing a monocle. He served in the Second World War, initially as Commander-in-Chief, Middle East, in which role he led the British forces to victory over the Italians, sorry Italians, in Western Egypt and Eastern Libya during Operation Compass in December 1940, only to be defeated by the German army. Of course, so basically, he basically took over all of the uh, Italian possessions in Libya and whatnot, and he was on his way to Tunis. You know, job well done. Smash. We've, we've broken them. Smashed them. Broke them. Fantastic. Let's go on. Let's push forward. This this war will be over by Christmas. And then Rommel shows up. And it doesn't go well for him. So uh, he gets pushed all the way back to the uh, Egyptian border. Where he manages to hold. He manages to hold them. But, uh, yeah, he's just not able to... Um, he's not able to counter with the resources at hand. The uh, the lightning war. The, Brit the Blitzkrieg. So, yeah. Yeah, a fascinating career. Uh, he then served as Commander-in-Chief in India uh, from 1941 to 1943. And uh, he also served with um, ABDA Com. I think that's the... Um, oh, God, isn't that Burma? I think that might be Burma. Um, I think that might be Burma. I vaguely remember reading this. 
And uh, he then served as voice, Viceroy of India until his retirement in uh, 47. So, yeah, a great man. And, uh, you know, like his defeat, it wasn't really a defeat. It was kind of, he just got pushed back in uh, Egypt and then he was replaced by Montgomery. But um, you got to understand, like, this guy is obviously of an age uh, which had a slightly different mentality. And it's sometimes difficult to remember the, the, the because we're so used to having tanks and stuff like this now, the, the revolution that was mechanised warfare. Like, the reason why people raved about like Rommel and stuff like this is because he was managing to do things in a way that no one else had envisaged it. Um, the only guy that came close was Bertrand, uh, not Bertrand, I was going to say Bertrand Russell, uh, Little Heart, same era-ish, but Little Heart is uh, like a historian and um, he was like the main British uh, tactical dude, strategy guys, um, strategy guy, and uh, he was the only one who came close to understanding the sort of the, the versatility and the usefulness of, of mechanised warfare and what it would be. And if you've ever read Rommel's book, I recommend that because, he, you know, he goes into it to a massive degree um, how it will be used. And no one had thought about it this way. No one had considered these things this way at all. You know, uh, it was still brand new. And, um, yeah, you know, it wasn't until the end of the Second War, World War that tanks became the core of most modern armies, whereas before they were just kind of viewed as... Uh, side things if you get me like uh just sort of i don't know i don't know it's difficult to explain but yeah Patton got it Patton got it but uh, other than that most of the allied commanders were pretty late on the game it seems to me this is the book that i'm going to be narrating and uh yeah this is just just to give you a, a vision into this guy's mind you know a career imperial soldier a man from a completely different mentality and uh, an age than ours and uh, yeah, I think it's it's going to be quite insightful for you to understand how men like this think uh, or thought. Uh, well, I say that. So some people think that these kind of dudes just don't exist anymore, but they do. They're just working as contractors for various different organisations. Yeah, I hope you enjoy. This is just a preview. Like I say, I'll have more information as uh, as I complete the book. But at the minute, this is the first chapter I've got done. So I wanted to give you it as a preview, as a taster of what you're going to get going forward. So I hope you enjoy it. Please give the video a like and all that. And uh, yeah, enjoy. Cheers. Campaigns and their lessons. The Palestine Campaigns. Introductory Chapter 1. Elements of the Campaigns. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon, Revelation 16. 1. The topography of the theatre of war. Historical associations, the Sinai Peninsula, the theatres of Palestine, Syria, harbours, railways and roads of the theatre of war, Turkish lines of communication, attitude of the population and political considerations. 2. The relations of the campaign to the war as a whole. The objectives of the campaigns. The influence of sea power, Germany and Turkey. 3. The Turkish army. Qualities of the Turkish soldier. Organisation and strength of the army. 1. The topography of the theatre of war. The campaigns in Sinai, Palestine and Syria were fought along one of the world's oldest and greatest highways, the main route between the earliest known cradles of civilization, the valleys of the Euphrates and of the Nile. From Egypt, its course keeps close to the sea, while passing over the inhospitable desert of Sinai. Thence it runs up the fertile plains of Philistia and Sharon, leaving the high rocky fortress of Judea to the east. It crosses the Carmel Range by a low pass to the plain of Astrilion, or Megiddo. Ascends past the Sea of Galilee to the plateau east of the Jordan, and so on to Damascus and Aleppo, whence the Euphrates Valley can be followed to Baghdad. Along this great road, the tides of thought, of trade, and of war have flowed between Africa and Asia since the dawn of history. It is well called by the Arabs Darab es Sultani, the Royal Road. Almost every name studied along that highway awakens a memory of some famous chieftain or of some noted deed. Gaza and Gath lie on it, 
cities of that strange people, the Philistines, who disappeared from history as mysteriously as they entered it. Romani, the ancient Pelusium, was the scene of a great battle between Persian and Egyptian 2,500 years ago. Asuf recalls a fierce afternoon struggle between Richard Cœur de Lyon and his illustrious adversary Saladin. Caesarea was named by a great ruler, Herod, after his greatest patron, Augustus. From Acre, Napoleon withdrew baffled for the first time in his career. The cities of Damascus and Aleppo have been, from the earliest days, the great marts and emporiums of eastern trade. The skills of the craftsmen of Damascus in the weaving of fabrics, in the making of weapons, and in the goldsmith's handiwork is commemorated today by words in common use in those arts. A note. Damask, Damascus steel, and Amasining are all derived from the city of Damascus. The great plain of Asdrilion, the traditional site of Armageddon, lies halfway between Egypt and Aleppo. It has seen many wars and many warriors. From Mount Tabor, a wild rush of mountain men destroyed Sisara's labouring host in the swampy plain below, much as the modern Parthen might swoop on a column in difficulties with its transports. More than 3,000 years ago, a host of irregular tribesmen camped in the plain, fled in sudden panic from Gideon's 300 well-disciplined and well-schooled warriors in the first night attack of which we have a detailed description. A note. See Judges 7. The main principles underlying Gideon's plan of action, his selection of disciplined men, careful reconnaissance and preparation, use of moral effect, are as necessary for success in a night operation today as they were in his time. A little further to the north, the fierce heat of a July day saw the doom of the Crusaders' short-lived kingdom when Saladin's horsemen attacked under cover of a smoke screen created by firing the scrub in the face of the Christian knights. Here, too, Napoleon's cavalry drove back the Turks while their leader was battering at Acre. Assyrian, Egyptian, Persian, Macedonian, Roman and Arab, all the great conquering nations have passed this way. It is fitting that in the greatest war of history, this strip of ground should have witnessed the master stroke of a sweeping victory in which practically every race of the British Empire took part. No apology is needed for the mention of events so far distant in those briefly catalogued in this introduction to a theatre of war that might well be termed the cockpit of nations. If the principles of war were not immutable, and therefore to be learned from the experience of the past, there would be little need of books on military history. The geography of a land determines the course of its wars, and a knowledge of previous campaigns serves to interpret the influence on strategy of the land's main topographical features. Certainly no commander ever gave more careful study to the history and topography of the theatre in which he was operating than did General Allenby. Two books he consulted almost daily, the Bible and George Adam Smith's Historical Geography of the Holy Land. Nor was it only the natural interest aroused in an acute and exceptionally well-informed mind that impelled him to reflect so often on the past of the land. From those reflections, he deduced much that was of value to him in planning his operations. The ancient highway, followed by the troops of the Egyptian expeditionary force from the Suez Canal to Aleppo, a distance of well over 500 miles, led them to traverse a remarkable variety of soil and scenery, the arid desert of Sinai, the fertile plains of Palestine, the bleak rocky hills of Judea, the sweltering trench of the Jordan Valley, and finally the cultivated uplands of Syria. A short description of the chief physical features of the theatre and an estimate of their military influence follows under three heads, Sinai, Palestine and Syria. More detailed information concerning those areas, which came to be the scene of the main operations, will be given in their appropriate place. It is, however, of importance to fix in mind at once the geographical considerations that decided the broad lines on which the campaigns developed. The triangular-shaped Sinai Peninsula 
240 miles from north to south and approximately 120 miles from east to west across the base of the triangle is one of the most desolate portions of the inhabited world. It may be divided roughly into three zones. The northern consists of a narrow coastal plain bordered by a belt of sand dunes of a breadth varying from 5 to 15 miles. Uh, These sand dunes are impassable for wheels and very heavy going for either mounted men or infantry. The central zone is a barren, stony plateau, rising to a height of 3,000 feet. There are no made roads for wheels, but the going is better and firmer than in the northern zone. The southern zone is a mass of rocky, precipitous mountains, some of which rise to 10,000 feet. The supply of water is precarious at all times, except after the winter rains have filled the ancient cisterns, relics of a bygone civilization. Nowhere in the peninsula is any permanent stream of running water, but certain channels, such as the Wadi El Arish, the River of Egypt of the Bible, and the Wadi El Mukshib in the central zone, become broad torrents for a short time after heavy rain. Water is scarcest in the southern zone, but is comparatively plentiful, though brackish, on the coast. Note, it is usually necessary to dig from 12 to 18 inches to get water, along which are scattered numerous oases of date palms. El Arish, at the mouth of the wadi of that name, and Nikal in the south, are the only considerable settlements of people in the peninsula. For the rest, a few nomad Bedouin are the sole inhabitants. The summer heat is scorching. In the winter, high cold winds and sandstorms are frequent. Many soldiers, mindful of Napoleon's well-known maxim on the frontiers of states, uh, note, the frontiers of states are either great rivers or chains of mountains or desert. Of all these obstacles opposing the progress of an army, the most difficult to surmount is the desert. Next come the mountains and third only the large rivers from military maxims of Napoleon. Regarded this barren desert as a sure protection to Egypt against invasion from Palestine, but it has been crossed by great armies times out of number, as a reference to military history would have shown. Also, the construction of the Suez Canal has contracted the desert by some 50 miles since Napoleon's time. The frontier incident of 1906 at Aqaba led the general staff at the war office to reconsider the problem of Egypt's eastern frontier. They then concluded that the desert was by no means an impassable obstacle to a modern army, but they estimated the maximum force that conditions of water supply would permit to approach the canal at 5,000 men and 2,000 camels. This proved to be an underestimate, but the crossing of the peninsula was quite obviously an undertaking which could be accomplished only after serious preparation and organisation. The exact extent of country designated by the name Palestine has varied at different periods. It will here be taken to include the territory from Dan to Beersheba, and from the Mediterranean to the Hejaz Railway. That is approximately the same area as is covered by the present British mandated territory of Palestine and by the Arab Kingdom of Transjordania. It is a small country. From Dan, or Banias, Uh, to Beersheba, is 150 miles, from the Mediterranean at Jaffa to the Hejaz Railway at Amman, 75 miles. Uh, Note, the total area of Palestine as thus defined is rather less than that of Wales. Yet it is so divided by its remarkable physical features as to present the most sudden variations of terrain and of climate. Note, witness, for instance, the feat of Benaiah, who slew a lion in a snowstorm. Indeed, so parcelled out is this small land that it has never been united under one rule, save as a province of some conquering alien, such as Roman or Turk. Its salient physical features are two mountain ranges separated by the most extraordinary crack in the Earth's surface, and a strip of fertile plain between the western range and the sea. The eastern range, the mountains of Mob, 3,000 to 3,500 feet, sink down gradually to the desert on the east and abruptly to the Jordan on the west. The other range, the Judean hills, is the real backbone of the region. It also falls steeply to the Jordan, whereas on the Mediterranean side its descent to the coastal plain 
is more gradual. Between the two ranges runs the Valley of Jordan, seven feet below sea level at late Hula, 680 feet below at Lake Tiberius, only 10 miles to the south, and 1,300 feet at the Dead Sea, 65 miles further on. Uh, Note, this depression is continued south as far as Aqabar on the Red Sea, but there is a watershed between the Dead Sea and Aqaba. The dissection of the country is complicated by two depressions running east and west, the one large and obvious, the other less noticeable, though it marks a very distinct change in the character of the country. The Great Depression is the plain of Astrillion, continued eastwards by the Yermuk Valley. The lesser is that between Samaria and Judea, which may be defined by a line drawn from the sea to the Jordan following the river Oja, north of Jaffa. The wadis Deir Balut, En Nemir, and Es Samir, and another river, also called Ajir which flows into the Jordan eight miles north of Jericho. Uh, note, uh, this depression is continued south as far as Aqaba on the Red Sea, but there is a watershed between the Dead Sea and Aqaba. This was, as will be seen, the line aimed at and secured by General Allenby after the capture of Jerusalem and held during the summer of 1918 up to the final advance. For consideration of its military properties, the Palestine Theatre may then be subdivided into A. The Maritime Plain and Plain of Astrillion, B. The Judean Hills, C. The Jordan Valley, D. Transjordania. A. The Plain Country, Philistia, Sharon and Astrillion. These plains, as we have already seen, form the natural and historical route for great armies. The coastline is fringed by a strip of sand dunes, varying in width from a few hundred yards up to half a mile, and rising in places to a height of 150 feet above sea level. Inland from the sand hills, the plain stretches some 10 to 15 miles to the foothills of the main Judean range. It is gently undulating and intersected with numerous small wadis, From April to June, it is under crops. In the dry season, there are no serious obstacles to military movement along this plain, from Gaza to Galilee, save one small stream, the Aouja, north of Jaffa, and that low spur of the main range which divides Sharon from Estrillion and ends near Haifa in Mount Carmel. The Aouja... Above mentioned and the brook Kishon in the plains of Australian are almost the only perennial streams of running water. Local needs for the normal population are amply met from deep wells, but these are inadequate for the requirements of an army without special machinery and development. The plain land of Palestine is on the whole healthy, though special precautions against malaria are necessary. The summer is hot, but not unbearably so. The Kamsin winds are, however, most oppressive and provoke an intolerable thirst. The chief feature of the climate is its division into a dry and a rainy season. The regular rainy season lasts from November to March, but there is also a little rain at the end of October, the former rains of the Bible, and in late March and April, the latter rains. Between April and October, there is practically never even a shower, During the rainy season, large tracts of the plain land become a sea of mud, and the roads are often impassable. Uh, Note. Kings 18.44, where Elijah says to Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. That phrase in the Bible, the time of the year when the kings go forth to battle, need puzzle no one who has seen Palestine at the height of the rainy season, It is then impossible for either kings or lesser men to go forth to battle with any comfort or profit. B. Judean Hills The Judean range consists of a narrow table land at an average height of 2,400 feet. Its highest point runs up to approximately 3,500 feet, with frequent spurs shooting east and west at right angles to the main ridge. 
It has thus been compared to the skeleton of a flat fish. The direction of the spurs, between which run deep waddies, renders the traverse of an army along the range from north to south, or vice versa, a formidable undertaking in face of any opposition. The northern portion of the range, Samaria, is more open and fertile than the remainder. In winter, the weather may be for days at a time extremely bleak and cold. But on the whole, there are few better or healthier climates than that of Judea. The annual rainfall at Jerusalem is approximately the same as in London, but it is all concentrated into the five months of the rainy season, and few means exist for storing the water which runs rapidly off. Consequently, the problem of watering a large army in the hills during the summer is a serious one. In 1914, only two roads fit for wheels crossed the range, one from north to south by Nazareth, Nablus, Jerusalem, Hebron, to Beersheba, one from east to west by Jericho, Jerusalem, Jaffa. Operations in the Judean range were bound to be slow against an active enemy, in view of the limited means of communication and the facilities given to the defender by the broken nature of the ground. It was obvious that the main battles were likely to be pitched in the plain below. C. The Jordan Valley History shows the Jordan Valley and the Dead Sea acting as a serious barrier to passage between the Judean range and the mountains of Moab. The river, though its course is rapid and its banks often swampy and overgrown, seldom exceeds 70 or 80 feet in breadth and has many fords. It is not, therefore, in itself a particularly formidable obstacle, but the steepness of the descent from and ascent to the mountains on either side, the poverty of the communications, and the forbidding aspect and sweltering heat of the deeply cleft valley, have combined to restrict intercourse between the inhabitants of the two hill ranges. It has been the same with military hosts. Since the eruption of Israel into their promised land, there is little record of the movement of armies on this face of the Judean fortress, Yet in 1918, General Allenby's troops, by their two raids across the Jordan and their endurance of a long summer in the tropical heat of the valley, actually persuaded the Turk that the main effort of the army would be made across the Jordan. D. Transjordania The tableland east of the Jordan carries the railway from Damascus to Hejaz, from which the Turkish line of communication to Palestine branched off at Daria Junction. This fact gave it a considerable military importance during the campaigns. The railway, and indeed the whole of Transjordania, lies open to raid from the desert, a form of attack difficult to counter, as the Turks found at their cost. The country here, termed Syria, is roughly that lying between the Mediterranean and the desert, from Aleppo in the north to Galilee in the south. Uh, note, Strictly speaking, the term Syria includes also Palestine. The double wall of mountain characteristic of Palestine is continued into Syria. Thus the Judean hills have, as their counterpart in Syria, a much loftier series of ranges, which stretch along the coast right up to the Taurus Mountains. The most southern of these is the range of the Lebanons. The western slopes of these Syrian mountains come down close to the sea, leaving only a very narrow strip of plain at their foot. The eastern chain, the continuation northwards of the mountains of Moab, is formed by Mount Hermon and the anti-Lebanon. Enclosed between them and the Lebanon is the fertile valley of El Baca, which is geologically the beginning of the Jordan Rift. The southern slopes of Hermon descend to the Huron Plateau, a great wheat-producing district, at the eastern edge of which lies the Jabal Druz, home of a strange and turbulent people. North of the anti-Lebanon, about Homs, the eastern range sinks to a broad plateau, running northeast to the Euphrates. From Homs to Aleppo, the ground is open and level. Syria is a more fertile region than Palestine. It is irrigated by several large streams, and the difficulties of water supply to a large force are much less. The climate is similar to that of Palestine. Such is in outline the general topographical configuration of the theatre of war. 
To the commander of an army of invasions studying the character of the country he had to traverse, the most striking features would appear to be the remarkable variety of terrain and climate that he would meet, the seriousness of the water difficulties, the probable influence of the rainy season on his operations, and, in 1915 and 1916, the lack of good maps. Note, the best map available was the survey made by Lord Kitchener in 1878, when a subaltern in the Royal Engineers. It was excellent as far as it went, but the detail was not always sufficiently accurate for tactical purposes. There would still remain, for his attention, the most vital consideration to commanders of large armies, the adequacies or otherwise of the existing means of communication, by sea, by road, and by railway, to support his projected movements. This subject will be examined in succeeding pages. A. Sea Communications The long coast of Syria and Palestine has been singularly neglected by nature in the provision of harbours. Syria has two small ones at Alexandretta and Beirut, but neither is really satisfactory. Haifa, though a fair anchorage, has no facilities as a port. South of Haifa, the coast stretches to Egypt in a line unbroken by a single headland or inlet, sufficient to serve as shelter for seagoing vessels. Jaffa, the only place with any pretensions to be called a port, is merely an open roadstead, where landing is often most precarious. There have been in history many attempts to build harbours in Palestine, but none have proved successful. The coast is, says Adam Smith, strewn with the wreckage of harbours. Uh, note, from the Historical Geography of the Holy Land, Chapter 7. Consequently, Palestine has never yet been successfully invaded by sea. The strong currents and constant surf make the landing of men or stores on the open beach a difficult task, liable to interruption for days at a time. This fact proved in the campaign a serious handicap to the supply services of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force. B. Railways The railways existing in Palestine and Syria at the outbreak of the war consisted of those with three different gauges. There was, however, through communication from Aleppo to Afuel, with a break of gauge at Rayak. C. Roads Few metalled roads existed either in Syria or Palestine, but many tracks were passable for wheeled transport, including heavy motor transport during the dry season. The wet season was a severe handicap to movement, especially of motor transport. It will be convenient here to give an account of the Turkish lines of communication to the Palestine front, since on their working the fortunes of the campaign largely depended. They were peculiarly complicated and presented great difficulties of organisation, never the strong point of the Turk. Haider Pasha, on the eastern shore of the Bosphorus, opposite Constantinople, was the starting point of the Baghdad Railway and the main base of the Turkish forces both in Palestine and in Mesopotamia. Up to the Muslimi Junction, north of Aleppo, the same single-line track of standard gauge had to serve both theatres. In 1914, uh, the line was interrupted in two places, neither through the Taurus Range, about Byzanti Khan, northwest of Adana, nor through the Amenus Range, northwest of Aleppo, were the tunnels complete. All stores and personnel had therefore to cross these two ranges by road. In the winter, the state of the roads, particularly of that over the Amanus range, often caused prolonged interruption. Later in the campaign, the tunnels were sufficiently pierced to allow narrow-gauge lines to be laid and used through them, but the Taurus tunnel was only finally completed for broad-gauge, so as to permit through trains a very short time before the armistice. In November 1918... A note, some of the British prisoners from Kut were employed on these tunnels. It is said that they contrived to damage in one way or another every German aeroplane which passed through on its way to the Palestine front. Thus, throughout the greater part of the war, four transshipments were necessary between Haida Pasha and Aleppo, and much valuable motor and animal transport was locked up in the business of portage over the mountain passes. 
The next section, from Aleppo to Rayak, was a straightforward one, with no difficulties beyond the perpetual shortage of fuel and rolling stock. But at Rayak, a break of gauge necessitated a fifth transshipment, uh, from Rayak through Damascus and Dera, up to which point supplies for the troops in the Hejaz had to be carried over the same line, was the pre-war single-track meter-gauge line, which extended to within a short distance of Nablus, between Dara and Afoul, where it passed down the Yamuk Valley, a number of important bridges and tunnels rendered the line very vulnerable to attack by raid or sabotage. The Turks took immediate steps, when war was declared, to push the line south towards the Palestine frontier, employing Misner Pasha, the engineer of the Hejaz Railway. The trace followed was through Tulkaram, and thence down the maritime plain to Lud, keeping at a safe distance from the sea to prevent any possibility of a raid by landing parties. From Lud, the track of the Jaffa-Jerusalem line was used as far as Junction Station. Uh, note, a slight alteration of gauge was necessary, whence it was directed on Beersheba, which it reached in October 1915. To provide sleepers and material for this extension, the line from Jaffa to Lud was torn up, and also that portion of the Beirut line from Damascus to Mazarib, which duplicated the Hejaz line. In 1915-16, during the Turkish efforts to reach the canal, the Beersheba line was extended to El Uja on the Sinai border. And in 1917, a branch line was constructed from south of Junction Station to Gaza. In addition to the great length of these communications, approximately 1,275 miles from Haider Pasha to the Palestine front at Gaza and Beersheba, and the five transshipments, shortage of rolling stock and fuel, were constant sources of travel. There were no proper workshops, so that the repair of locomotives and wagons could not keep pace with requirements. Within a short period of the opening of war, the sea blockade effectively prevented any replenishment of coal stocks, so that wood fuel had to be used, with great loss of power. Even wood was eventually difficult to obtain. Turkish inefficiency and corruption enhanced the confusion on the communications, against which the German staffs found themselves powerless. Hence, it normally required at least a month to six weeks for reinforcements to pass from Constantinople to the front line. Sometimes, when the railways were congested, reinforcements marched from Rayak to southern Palestine, a distance of 250 miles. Two factors which had some influence on the design of the campaigns need a brief mention here, though they do not form part of the topography of the theatre. The first is the attitude towards either belligerent of the populations of Egypt, Sinai, Palestine and Syria. Of Egypt, it will suffice to say that the Turk greatly overestimated the likelihood of the Egyptian taking any active measures to throw off the overlordship of Great Britain and to resume that of Turkey. So far as was possible, the Egyptian people as a whole strictly disinterested themselves from the war. Note, there was, of course, agitation in favour of the Turk and unrest amongst a certain section of the population, but it was not, at this time, in general. The Bedouin of Sinai, again, were concerned merely to extract profit to themselves by service as guides or as spies to the nearest or best paymaster, or by entirely impartial looting, whenever opportunity offered. The inhabitants of Syria and Palestine, though long under Turkish domination, felt no enthusiasm for Turkey or her cause, except such bodies as the German settlements in Palestine. Certainly, in the latter stages of the war, the attitude of the inhabitants generally was more favourable to the invading British armies than to the Turk. The people of the Hejaz and large numbers of the tribes in the Arabian desert declared openly for the Allied cause, as will be shown later. The importance attached by the Allied governments to certain purely political considerations was the second factor. This is not the place to discuss the various pledges, not strictly reconcilable with each other, by which our government bound itself successively to the Arabs, Treaty of King Hussein, to France, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, and to the Jewish world, the Belfort Declaration. 
But the existence of these pledges, the traditional claims of France to influence in Syria, and the position of Jerusalem as a holy place of three great religions, had all to receive their due weight and added to the cares and anxieties of a commander-in-chief. Section 2. The Relations of the Campaign to the War as a Whole The campaigns of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force have been frequently termed a sideshow. If this expression is intended to imply that the campaigns were planned and executed independently of the march of events in the main theatre of war in Europe or in other theatres, it is certainly misapplied. To give its true perspective to the warfare in Sinai, Palestine and Syria, it is necessary to regard the battle line of Great Britain and her allies as a single one, which eventually extended across Belgium, France, Italy, the Balkans, the Mediterranean, the eastern border of Egypt, Arabia and Mesopotamia, even to the frontiers of India, and to consider the war as one continuous battle, fought on the accepted principles of the pre-war field service regulations, only lasting for years instead of days, and spread over hundreds of miles instead of thousands of yards. A great battle, as contemplated by field service regulations, normally comprised three phases. The first phase was the collision of the advanced troops, under cover of which the rival commanders developed their plan of action, while their armies gradually deployed their full strength. Our regular army, British and Indian, may be viewed in this analogy as the advanced guard, which covered the development by the British nation of its full fighting strength, a process which occupied nearly the whole of the first two years of the war. The second phase, when battle had been fairly joined by the main forces, was the struggle to obtain fire superiority and to exhaust the enemy's reserves in preparation for the final attack. In the war, this phase may be said to have lasted during the latter part of 1916 and all 1917. The third phase, the decisive great attack or counter-attack, and the exploitation of success once the enemy's line was broken, occupied the year 1918. Though possibly never so formulated, a conception of the war, something like the foregoing, must have existed in the minds of those responsible for imperial strategy as a whole and the picture may help the reader of this book to understand the strategical ideas underlying the instructions from the War Cabinet in London, which form the basis of these campaigns of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force. The campaigns, too, do, actually, as it happens, fall very uh, conveniently into three periods, Sinai, Palestine, Syria, corresponding generally with the three phases of a battle just outlined. The original object of our maintaining a force in Egypt at all was quite simple and definite. Its role was that of a detachment guarding a vital main line of communication. The reason for the subsequent adoption of an offensive policy will appear in the course of the narrative. The three main influences leading up to it may, however, here be summarised briefly. In the first phase, a scheme of protection which involved holding the Suez Canal throughout its whole length of 100 miles was obviously wasteful of troops, and an advance to the southern borders of Palestine was found the most effective and economical means of defence. Secondly, events in other theatres of war reacted on the strategy in Palestine and impelled a forward policy. Thirdly, certain considerations which were political rather than strategical had at times a considerable influence. It may be argued that if offensive action against the Turkish armies in Syria and Palestine became necessary, sea power uh, could have provided a quicker and more effective means of striking than the long land campaign actually undertaken. It certainly does seem strange at first sight that the greatest sea power in history should have sent its armies from Egypt to Aleppo by a march of over 500 miles, when its goal lay distant from a seaport only some 75 miles. But the reasons are really not far to seek. Aleppo did not become an objective until a very late stage of the war. When the force set out from the canal, it intended only to secure control of the Sinai Desert. The development of its mission into that of administering the coup de grace to the Ottoman Empire was a very gradual process. Moreover, 
The potentialities of combined naval and military action in this theatre of war were limited by several circumstances. The lack of harbours and the insecurity of landing operations on the shores of Syria and Palestine have already been indicated. In any case, the growth of modern armies and the bulkiness of some of their indispensable equipment, such as heavy guns and lorries, seem to set a limit to the expediency of landing operations, except as a prelude to the seizure of a well-equipped port as base. Further, submarines were a very real menace in the Mediterranean, and were even more difficult to combat than in home waters. We did, as all know, endeavour to use our naval power against Turkey at the beginning of the war, in fact to administer a knockout blow in the first round by forcing the Dardanelles. The failure of that venture was not calculated to encourage landing operations elsewhere. Yet our command of the sea was in other ways an important asset in the Palestine campaigns, In addition to the material help afforded by warships in battles on the coast within range of their guns, and by storeships in landing large quantities of bulky supplies at various stages of the advance, the morale effect of the sea power was invaluable. It immobilised an appreciable number of Turkish units and of long-range guns for shore protection, It forced on the Turkish railways in the southern Palestine a larger and more difficult inland trace than would otherwise have been necessary, and it assisted General Allenby in the Third Battle of Gaza to deceive the Turk as to his real line of attack. It was ships of the Royal Navy which on occasions brought timely succour and comfort to the Arab revolt in the Hejaz. Finally, it may be noted that our sea communications with Great Britain and India, in spite of their great length, actually gave us an advantage in point of time over the inefficient rail communications between Constantinople and the front line. To turn to the Turkish side of the picture, though it was not known to our government at the time, Turkey had in fact bound itself to Germany by treaty before the shot was fired in Europe and her three months of nominal neutrality between August and November 1914 were spent in preparation for the moment when Germany should give the signal for action. Uh, Note, see chapter 17 of Winston Churchill's The World Crisis. The terms of the treaty have not been disclosed, but Turkey was no doubt promised territorial aggrandizement at the expense of Russia in the Caucasus and probably of the unfortunate but powerless Persia in Azerbaijan. She may also have been encouraged to hope for the restoration of her sovereignty over Egypt, though it is unlikely that Germany would have permitted the real control to have escaped her own hands. Germany certainly must have persuaded the adventurers who ruled Turkey, Enver, Talat and Jamal, that they were coming in on an absolute certainty. Otherwise, the policy of Turkey in joining the war was suicidally rash. She had little to gain and much to lose. Note. But the Turk has always been unaccountable. A former British ambassador to Turkey summed him up as follows. When you wish to know what a Turkish official is likely to do, first consider what it would be to his interest to do, next what any other man would do in similar circumstances, and thirdly what everyone expects him to do. When you have ascertained these, you are so far advanced on your road that you may be perfectly certain that he will not adopt any of these courses. Her finances, her warlike stores, and her reserves of manpower had been drained by a succession of wars. She was thus dependent on Germany for money and munitions and had to pay the price by submitting to German dictation of her strategy and to a large measure of German control in the management and direction of her armies. The partnership was never a happy one. The Turks chafed at German interference, often tactlessly exercised, and by passive resistance nullified much German endeavour to substitute order for confusion. The Germans, in their turn, were exasperated by the inefficiencies and inertia of their allies. From the first, the strategical aims of the two countries were at variance. Apart from the short life-and-death struggle in Gallipoli, Turkey was constantly engaged on free fronts in the Caucasus against Russia and in Palestine and Iraq against Great Britain. Of these three, the Caucasus theatre was to Turkish minds the most important. It was nearest to the Anatolian core of their empire. 
and it was where they most desired and expected territorial expansion. The Germans, on the other hand, looked askance at Turkish efforts against Russia, which could bring little advantage to the Central Powers in their principal struggle. They were continually endeavouring to divert the main weight of their allies' troops to other objectives. In the latter half of 1916, the pick of the Turkish army was actually serving at the bidding of an imperious partner on the Russian and Romanian fronts in Europe, while the Asiatic theatres were left to look after themselves. Thus, there was continual friction. The two principal advantages which the Germans hoped to gain from the Turkish alliance were probably the closing of the Dardanelles between Russia and her allies, and the embarrassment of Great Britain with her large Mohammedan population by the declared hostility of the head of Islam. But the Jihad, proclaimed in November 1914, had little effect, and measures were taken to deal with German propaganda in Muslim countries. Given even moderately good communications, the geographical position of Turkey should have conferred on her the advantage of interior lines in regard to her free Asiatic fronts, but the communications were thoroughly inadequate. The defects of the line to the Palestine front have already been catalogued, and the lines to the other fronts were worse than those to Palestine. Not even German organisations succeeded in removing this handicap. Note, the Turks must have contained much larger numbers of their adversaries than they themselves put in the field, and in this respect must have been a most useful ally to the Germans. Figures are dangerous, but the following rough estimate of available rifles gives some idea of the comparative strengths of the Turks and the Allies in the principal theatres in the latter part of the war. August 1917, the Caucasus, the Turks 64,000, Allies 123,000, Palestine 36,000, Allies 96,000, Mesopotamia, Turks 35,000, Allies 85,000. August 1918, Caucasus, Turks, 56,000, Allies, 160,000. Palestine, Turks, 36,000, Allies, 100,000. Mesopotamia, Turks, 22,000, Allies, 100,000. Part 3. The Turkish Army. The sword had been the virtue of the children of Othman, and swords had passed out of fashion nowadays in favour of deadlier and more scientific weapons. Life was growing too complicated for this childlike people whose strength had lain in simplicity and patience and in their capacity for sacrifice. The Seven Pillars of Wisdom the Turkish Empire, as it existed in 1914, contained a heterogeneous mixture of races and creeds, including besides Turks, Arabs, Armenians, Kurds, Syrians and others. The Anatolian Turk was the backbone of the empire. He is a fine soldier of the rough-and-ready type, with extraordinary powers of endurance, great patience under hardships and privations, a certain inherited aptitude for warfare and stolid courage in battle. These are, and always will be, high military virtues. But the exigencies of modern war demanded also great technical skill to handle complex weapons and equipment, and the moral staying power that only a high level of education can give. Of these qualities, the uneducated, illiterate Turkish peasant was entirely deficit. A large proportion of the officers could barely read or write. The technical equipment of the army was completely out of date. The experience of the Balkan War against Bulgaria and Serbia in 1912 had shown the many defects in Turkey's military administration. This war had also cost her serious casualties, which fell on the best fighting elements of her population. After her defeat, she turned once more to Germany for help to modernise her military methods. The Germans, who had, in the past, supplied many instructors to the Turkish army, now sent, towards the end of 1913, General Lyman von Sanders as head of a military mission of some 70 German officers to regenerate the Turkish forces. He had little time to effect any marked change before the outbreak of the European War. Note. 
Lyman von Sanders was never on good terms with the vain and obstinate Enver, who seems usually to have disregarded his wholesome advice. But Lyman von Sanders himself was obviously no diplomat, since he seems to have been constantly at loggerheads, not only with the Turkish authorities, but also with the German officials in Constantinople. In August 1914, the Turkish army comprised 36 divisions, all much below establishment. During the war, 34 other divisions were formed. Uh, Note, some of these, the Caucasus divisions, were formed by amalgamations of existing divisions. But since heavy losses frequently caused disbandments, there were at no time more than 43 divisions in the field. A division normally consisted of three regiments, each of three battalions and a machine gun detachment, a rifle battalion from 24 to 36 field guns and ancillary services. In practice, divisions varied greatly in strength. An army corps contained two or three divisions. There were grave deficiencies in heavy artillery, technical units, transport and supply services, medical personnel and equipment. There was no effective air service. These deficiencies the Germans set themselves to remedy. Until Bulgaria had joined the Central Powers and Serbia had been overrun, difficulties of communication hampered the supply of munitions to Turkey. Germany's own needs, too, were urgent. Eventually, the Germans supplied the equipment and the majority of the personnel for the air arm, signals, mechanical transport and other technical services, besides sending a few infantry battalions. The Austrians contributed some heavy artillery and medical personnel. The Germans also aimed more and more, as the war went on, to arrogate to themselves the principal staff appointments in the Turkish armies and to control the working of the railways. It was their claims and pretensions in these two spheres that aroused most friction, since many of the Germans were overbearing and tactless. The abundance of the rations, clothing and other comforts on which the Germans insisted for their own units, however congested might be the lines of communication, contrasted too sharply with the frequent shortage of food and necessaries in the Turkish units not to cause discontent. Further, the Germans, for all their efficiency, never seem to have appreciated the idiosyncrasies of the fighting methods of their allies. They frequently ordered counter-attacks or movements requiring a promptness of action and a precision of manoeuvre unknown to the Turks, with consequent failure and mutual recrimination. All things considered, the Germans put almost as much grit as oil into the military machine. The Turks are said to have called up and enrolled as many as 2.7 million men in the war, a very large percentage of the available military population. Yet so heavy were the losses and so large the number of desertions that the maximum strength of the army was probably never more than 650,000. The true Anatolian Turk... In spite of short rations, poor equipment and a complete ignorance of the causes and objects of the war, retained his morale and fought well to the end. But amongst the other races, which had to be drawn on increasingly as the war was prolonged, disaffection was rife and desertion very frequent. In spite of all the defects of his organisation, the Turk was an enemy by no means to be despised. He was a fine marcher and could dispense with many of the impediments necessary to European armies. On the defensive, his eye for ground, his skill in planning and entrenching a position, and his stubbornness in holding it, made him a really formidable adversary to engage. In the offensive, he always attacked gallantly, though often with little skill. The Turkish artilleryman handled his gun well and shot accurately, but the cavalry were poorly mounted and seldom effective. On the value to be assigned to the Turk as a fighting man depends largely the worth of the tactical lessons to be drawn from these campaigns. That he had not the military qualities of Germany is, of course, obvious, but that he must stand high on any list of the martial nations of the world is equally true. Note, the writer has occasionally amused himself by making a handicap on the lines of a golf handicap of all the nations which took part in the late war, according to their martial qualities. He has found that the Turk is usually said to receive five or six strokes from the nation placed at scratch. On mentioning this to a distinguished officer, the latter replied that his handicap was always on racing lines and that the Turk carried about eight stone twelve ounces, 
when top weight was nine stone seven ounces. The British army certainly cannot belittle the men who forced them to abandon the Gallipoli enterprise, who captured a complete division at Kut, who crossed the Sinai Desert to the Suez Canal, and who checked the first two onslaughts at Gaza. H.S. Gullit, in the Australian Official History, Volume 7, has caught the likeness of the Turkish soldier well. He says, Such conditions would have been fatal to the spirit and fighting capacity of any European troops engaged in a similar campaign. But the Turk, as a fighter, is unlike any other soldier in the world. Even when he is wretchedly fed and miserably equipped, he will continue month after month and year after year. A dangerous foe to troops of a higher civilization, fighting under the happiest conditions. No set of circumstances, however depressing, appears able to diminish his dogged resistance. While if the opportunity is propitious, he can always be stirred to the offensive. Note. The Turkish numbers at any given period or engagement are very difficult to arrive at. To the difficulty, well known to all soldiers, of distinguishing between ration, combatant and rifle strengths, are added the Turkish neglect to obtain and record accurate returns, and the natural tendency of a defeated force to minimise its numbers. The strengths given in this volume are based on the most probable estimates available, but can never be regarded as a strictly accurate figure. The official histories of the Mesopotamian campaign says on this point the numbers and armaments of the Turkish forces at any fixed time cannot be estimated with entire accuracy. Their own figures obtained during and after the war are often unreliable. Casualties were frequently not reported and fraudulent returns were not unknown. Well, there we go, boys and girls. That's just a brief preview of the uh, upcoming audio book. So I hope you enjoyed this. Let me know in the comments what you think. And uh, please do like the video. I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. More stuff is coming soon. Stay tuned on the channel. Subscribe, all that stuff. And uh, I'll see you again soon. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.